Harple is a dreamer. Following a dream wedding and a dream honeymoon, she dreamed up a way to give a nostalgic childhood treat a chic upgrade. She ordered her first cotton candy machine, secured all the social media handles, and Art of Sucra was born. Emily launched Art of Sucra as an events-based business, spinning out-of-the-box flavors of cotton candy at weddings, parties, and concerts. But in 2020, Emily knew that she either had to pivot her business or lose everything that she worked so hard to build from the ground up. Fast forward to today, and Emily has completely reimagined Art of Sucra into an e-commerce powerhouse with a massive social following, offering hand-spun cotton candy and the oh-so-viral cotton candy glitter bombs in a variety of colors and flavors like Island Punch, Peach Bellini, and Strawberry Bubblegum, just to name a few. Today on Small Business Big Conversations, Emily Harple and the Art of Sucra. Emily, it is so nice to meet you. Thank um, you. I wore pink today. <laughs> My this is the pinkest thing I had in in honor of all this cotton candy goodness. So so it's it's awesome to meet you and and I'm excited to you know learn about your story. Tell me about Art of Sucra, if I'm pronouncing that right. I am. That right? was perfect. I've been practicing it. I'm I... really proud. That was <laughs> most people do not get it on the first try, so that was great. So where? So tell us all about it. Where did the idea come from? And and what is all of it? Let me take you back to 2016. Okay. And I was just wrapping up my undergrad degree in psychology, and then was also planning my wedding at the same time. So naturally, I was spending a lot of time on Pinterest mm -hmm. and really noticed that a lot of desserts were getting this kind of Instagrammable upgrade, right? We're talking like donut wall Definitely. era, sugar cookies that are art, cake pops, the whole thing. And I could not figure out what I wanted to do for wedding favors. I don't know why that was the hardest part of planning my wedding and just kept seeing desserts and cotton candy kept popping up. But it was really scary <laughs> cotton candy. It was ones with like cartoon clowns on it and there weren't really any <laughs> flavors associated with it. It was just pink or blue. And I really couldn't let the idea go. Yeah. So on my honeymoon on the way back, I got married very young and my husband's even younger than I am. And we drove to Florida. So we had a lot of time in the car together. I looked at him, I had him trapped and I was like, hey, what do you think about me starting a cotton candy company? And fully expected him to say, girlfriend, you're crazy. Go get a real job. Like that's not something we can do. And he didn't. You guys are newlyweds though. I don't we know were. If, he's, if he's allowed to criticize yet at that point. As I, early on in the I would have criticized. So it would have been turntables. I would have been like, absolutely not. What are you doing? Um, but yeah, I took my, I took the money from our wedding and bought my very first cotton candy car. I had literally never even spun a cone of cotton candy in my life, mm -hmm. had an LLC, had the business name, taught myself how to do everything. And then I did events for four years. So it just spin not just normal cotton candy, it's champagne and Manhattan and watermelon. And it was really an experience. So I did that all throughout Northeast Ohio and then transitioned into packaging. And we now have an e-commerce store that we ship our cotton candy all over the world. So let's talk about that because you guys are in a, a, a very different place now for, yes. a, from a company standpoint than you were when you first began. So talk about that pivot and what prompted that. I think I know because I yes. know when it happened. So I'm sure you can guess. <laughs> um, yeah, COVID happened. And obviously cotton candy is not essential. And so I went from, you know, having six cotton candy carts with a small team of, I wouldn't even call them employees. It was friends that would help out mm -hmm. and things like that to, you know, not having a job essentially. And so I got to the point where COVID wasn't just two weeks anymore. It had been a couple of months and events were not coming back and I had to do something. So decided to transition into packaging, which is really ironic because it was something that I swore I would never do. And here we are. Um, but throughout that process, I started posting on TikTok and mm -hmm. we had a lot of success there. So it took about a year to develop the packaging and then launched the online store in March of 2021. So you mentioned that when you were doing the research, there were, you know, you were just seeing clown faces with pink and blue cotton candy, which matches again, perfectly. <laughs> again, I'm just calling it out. Um, but we have seen, as you've also mentioned, with cupcakes and cake pops and all that stuff, like the bougie take on uh, novelty treats and things like that. Tell me about your spin on cotton candy. 
Yeah, so it just felt like it was really being left behind. And now that essentially I'm a manufacturer, it's what we do. I understand why, because cotton candy is really delicate and it was really quite the process to Mm -hmm. give it that upgrade. You can't just really Google how does one make cotton candy and get a full explanation like you can a recipe for a sugar cookie, right? Um, So that's, I I saw the opportunity there and then it took a lot of my time, blood, sweat, and tears to really develop that into that unique upgrade that you see now. But a lot of that has to do with social media because everybody Mm -hmm. wants something that's beautiful, that's branded, that really elevates a moment in your life, whatever that is. Um, And and like you said, we've seen that across a lot of other desserts and industries, and it's done really well. It's really kind of revitalized that space in a lot of ways. So when I am thinking back, I started my company in 2016 too. And when I started Brewboat Cleveland, I didn't know anything about boating at all. I didn't own, I didn't I never owned a boat previously. I didn't know anything about the maritime industry, but I quickly had to become an expert in Coast Guard regulations mm-hmm. and, you know, what the legalities on the water and things like that are. I have to imagine in food packaging, there's all kinds of regulations and manufacturing and stuff that goes into that. What are you, what did you have to become an expert in? <sighs> Other than spinning cotton candy uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that you had to learn, that you had to teach yourself. <laughs> but what did you have to become an expert in when you went into packaging and everything that comes along with food products? Oh, boy. Was that a ride? Because it's it's so interesting, especially with, with it being cotton candy. It's a non-toxic product. So essentially what that means is that bacteria can't grow on sugar. And cotton candy is really just sugar. So I don't have to worry about anything being refrigerated. There's no milk. There's no eggs. There's no anything mm-hmm. that can really make you sick. And mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, cotton candy will simply just disintegrate. It doesn't really expire. It's not going to You're saying you. it's like the healthiest thing there is. Right? I mean, it's honestly, it right. Sick. It's just sugar. <laughs> and it's a small amount of sugar. It's like eating a Jolly Rancher, which is really shocking to people too. But all that to say... When I was calling around to the health department, and now we work with the FDA closely, you don't really get a straight answer, which was the most challenging part about mm-hmm. learning all of that. And and you're trying to do the right thing of getting all the regulations, and you get kind of passed back and forth. Well, the health department's like, yeah, you're really more the agriculture department. And then the agriculture department's like, actually, you're kind of both. You're also in the health department. And so I experienced a lot of that when... I did events, which honestly was more challenging, shockingly enough, than it was to transition into packaging because we stopped working with the health department and really focused on just the agriculture department and the FDA. So we've gotten really close with our inspector and now we are Mm -hmm. on like a first name email basis of, hey, I have a question about this. What are your thoughts? How does the packaging have to look? They approve everything for us. So my number one piece of advice is do not be afraid to ask questions and become friends with your inspector because honestly, that makes or breaks the entire experience, but it's really, it's no joke. There's a lot of regulations that we have to follow. My team has to be trained in mm-hmm. all of that and food safe. And we obviously would never want to send out something that wouldn't be safe for whatever sure. reason yep. for someone to eat. So it's, it's something that even now, seven years later, I get really anxious on inspections days and we always pass with flying colors, but it does still make me very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so seven years have gone by, you started in the event space, you transitioned to packaging. What are some ways that uh, about running the company that you've had to change, not just not just the the structure of the company, but as a business owner and as a manager of a team and in in the manufacturing space and that sort of thing? um, How have you had to adapt? A lot. Um, It went from really being just me kind of on my own to now we have a team of almost 20. And so there's really no handbook on how to be a boss and how Mm -hmm. to handle every situation. And I can even see in the past two years how much I've changed as a person, but as a boss. And and I try to create an environment that's someplace that I would want to come and work every day and, and try to really, you know, work alongside of my team. And that's been really challenging and really rewarding. I'm very, very, very lucky that I have a really incredible team. But even just from a process standpoint, so much has changed for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the types of collaborations that we do, how we market everything, the internal process of just organization is way different because it's not just me and all in my head. I have to, you know, communicate that to other people and make sure they understand and that they then go out and implement all of those things. So lots of big changes, but I would not change it for anything. I am so much more content and love the way that the business is now than when we were doing events. So you mentioned how you market everything. I am 
in love with the way that you guys have embraced um, your social media presence and everything that you've done. And that's really how you gained like so much notoriety in the space. Um, so I want to dive into that and we're going to do that right after this break. We'll be back with more small business, big conversations with Emily right after this. My name is Christopher Harris. I'm the owner operator of Black Frog Brewery. Um, we're currently in Toledo, Ohio with an expansion plan for Cleveland. I understand my business on a different level than I did before the impact program. It just made me a better business owner. Jumpstart provides capital, services, and connections to help entrepreneurs grow. Get started today at jumpstartinc.org. We are back on Small Business Big Conversations with Emily Harpole of Art of Sucra. And I really want to talk about one of my favorite things, and that is business branding. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I didn't know anything about <laughs> like how I was going to run boats when I started my company, but I knew that I could market it and I knew that I could sell it as long as I came up with a cool brand and made it look immediately bigger than it already was like when I started. Um, so business branding, especially for a luxury item, right, or something that is a want and not a need is so important. Um, what would you say is the vibe of Art of Sucra? Oh, I love that question. What is the vibe? I think it's fun, but it also has, like you said, that luxury upgrade. It's not the typical product that you're going to see on the shelf. The very first thing that people say to us is your packaging, your branding. I love it. It is the first comment, even above and beyond what the product tastes like, because it's your first impression. Right. So you want to be a part of it. You want to pick it up and hold it. It, it piques your interest more than anything. How did you go through the process of developing? Uh, I mean, the colors of the packaging and that sort of thing are they, you know, are, are I guess, an homage to the colors of cotton candy anyway. Yeah. But how did you go through in, in really defining your brand with the fonts and, and your color palette and your logo and all that? Like what went into that for you? I had a very specific vision. Unfortunately, okay. I was not gifted with the skill set of how to make that happen. So I have an incredible design team that could just kiss the floor that they walk on. <laughs> Their names are Molly and Jackie, and they can literally just pick the idea out of my brain and immediately create it into packaging. When I say that they quite literally held my hand throughout the entire process, the brand would not exist if it was not for them because it's the first piece that you see and they yeah. do everything, packaging, website, anything visual besides the filming of our TikToks, which is just me on my iPhone, they do all of it. So let's talk. TikTok, because you guys blew up on TikTok. And, you know, when you open, um, you know, some of these packages and you drop them into drinks, they are visually incredibly, um, you know, Instagrammable and TikTokable and that sort of thing. Um, tell us a story and, and uh, about how you kind of rose on TikTok. Um, and and maybe a few tips for other business owners out there that, that want to get started that way. I think I was, you know, on TikTok like most of us were in 2020, yeah. and it was more I was consuming the app. Drew and I would, my husband would, you know, text videos back and forth, and it was really at the age of dancing and songs going viral and that type of thing. And at some point, I just got really bored of being at home and not working. And so I had all of these old clips that I had from events that I used to do. And most of them were boomerangs, which is, you know, a little hard to edit and a little embarrassing. But I did it. And the first videos don't scroll all the way back. They're horrible <laughs> and super embarrassing. But do yeah. scroll yeah. all the way back. <laughs> Please, no, really, you really, you don't want to. Um, but you have to start somewhere. And so I had, I had all that B-roll on my phone and just started playing around with it. Yeah. And taught myself how to, I will use the term lightly, video edit on InShot on my phone. And 
just was really consistent with it. I was posting three to four videos a day. We had one video would get like 11,000 views. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so famous. Like this is crazy. <laughs> and then it really just started to snowball from there. And we had a video that has 26 million views that really kind of put us on the map. We hit a million followers in like four months. Yeah. It happened really quickly. Um, and one thing that I think helped that is that all of our videos are in one style. So you yeah. you rarely see my face. Occasionally, I'll pop up, but it's very rare. And those videos do not perform as well, which I'm choosing not to take personally. <laughs> um, but mainly, it's my hands using the product and me voicing it over. And I think it also helps, too, that my product's really unique. Yeah. And also, it just really lends itself to video as a medium, too. So... That's how that happened. So what would you say is, uh, you know, are some of, is it consistency and frequency uh, are the ways to kind of ride that algorithm to get the most views? Definitely consistency. And also I just think it's so important, especially with TikTok, it becomes the app of trends, right? Yeah. But the problem is when you're doing these trends, you may go viral for it, but you're probably not getting followers from it. Mm -hmm. You really have to show who you are, show your brand, show your personality, find your own little niche or whatever works for you. That's how you're gonna create a community, which is way more important over a following. Um, what about influencer marketing? Uh, I mean, it probably helps when somebody like Elise Myers uh, opens your product. It does. <laughs> you know, in video and <laughs> yeah. like that. Definitely. So what's what's so interesting is because as a brand, we have 1.3 million followers. I feel like we kind of fall in this weird category of, yes, we're a brand and we're a business, but we're also kind of influencers in and of ourselves. Yeah. So there's a really back-end community on TikTok. I don't know if people know this, but if you mutually follow somebody, you can DM. So... Elise obviously popped up out of nowhere. She made a video about how at a winter formal, she missed being crowned the princess of winter formal because she was spinning her own cone of cotton candy. <laughs> so naturally we do edit the video and she saw it, commented on it. She yeah. followed us. Now we message all the time. Elise is great. And we just shipped her a bunch. She wears our beer and sugar daddy crew neck in at least half of her videos. It's it's wild. So we've been very lucky. We don't have to pay any influencers, but if we have a relationship, that gifting helps. And mm -hmm. obviously if, you know, people love to buy things supported by their favorite creators. So it's just as much opportunistic as anything is is you still have to be a consumer Absolutely. because you have to see what to duet and, and everything else, especially on that platform. You have to spend a lot of time on the app getting to know it to be able to understand the culture of it. And mm -hmm. it changes so frequently that you have to, unfortunately, it's a time thing. You have to spend time on it. So how else are you guys growing your customer base? A lot of it is through social media, obviously, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or any of that. We started to do things with other brands where we will do giveaways, things like that, but we'll also yeah. do activations with other brands. So Amika is a really popular hair care company and they do a lot of influencer gifting and they okay. have a much bigger budget than I do. So we'll partner <laughs> with them to, you know, give glitter bombs for events or, you know, cotton candy. That's a custom Amika flavor, whatever that looks like. So we really do lean on our other brand friends and partners to kind of grow our audience outside of just posting on TikTok. So you got your undergrad uh, in psychology mm -hmm. from the University of Akron, right? I did. Go Zips. <laughs> um, not a lot of people know this, but I was Zippy for a year. Wow. Uh, I feel like I'm like so now sitting you are in also in, well, you're celebrity. In the, well, you're the celebrity. Uh, <laughs> I had to, I wasn't allowed to take the head off. Um, how much, uh, how much of what you learned in psychology goes into the packaging and the branding and what you're saying on social and how you're talking to customers. Oh yeah, I mean, it helps. It helps just with human interaction, right? And that is social media and interacting with customers and my team and building, again, community, I feel like is such a buzzword, but the yeah. reality is it is so important because you can have 3 million, 30 million followers, but have zero community and no one's going to buy from you. Yeah. So we really try to make it a point to have our business be something that people feel like they are invested in emotionally, financially, whatever that is, but we want their feedback. So when we post, hey, what are your thoughts on this new packaging or this new cotton candy flavor? People flood to us and say, we love that. How have you tried this? Have you tweaked that? Mm -hmm. And you really feel like you are a part of something and that you're being heard and then how cool is it when that product goes on the shelves do you have a way to gauge that so like you you mentioned that you know elise wears your shirt in mm -hmm. her videos does like the sale of merch with your brand on it help you understand like at what level 
you have a community and how invested they are. Definitely. And we can see instantly if Elise posts a video in our crew neck with that says beer and sugar daddy, sales will uptick. So I will get a notification on my phone in Shopify and I'll scroll through and say, oh, you know, multiple crew necks are being sold right now. <laughs> and then I'll go at least post it a video and I can go and find exactly which one it is. And and you can absolutely track that. We can know too. Um, Allison Cooch has posted about us mm -hmm. and, and we saw, you know, posts from that and could track it back to that video too. So part of your brand promise, I read on your website, <laughs> is that it is truly the small things that bring the most joy. What brings you joy as a business owner? I think it's all the things that we just talked about. It's it's the branding, it's the community, it's the meeting people, it's the stories that people have, which sounds so wild of something as small as cotton candy. But it's it's that nostalgic touch of you know having a memory with your parents that have passed or being a part of your wedding. It's it's all of those small moments that mm -hmm. yes, we're not doing open heart surgery, but to be able to bring joy to people, especially in this day and age is really something important and special that I do not take for granted, for sure. So just to follow on to that, um, and maybe just a bit of commentary, when you're active on social, especially on TikTok and Instagram, if people are duetting those moments with your videos and that sort of thing, that's got to be a, a celebratory moment for you, right? Like oh, just yeah. seeing what that means and knowing that that's a community that you intentionally cultivated. Absolutely. And it makes running a business is no joke, right? It's it's a lot. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot of work. And, and it makes that hard portion worth it. Mm -hmm. That at the end of the day is what makes it worth it, especially when you're running an e-commerce. It's so insular. You don't get to see people experiencing it every day. But when you do get to see it, it's really special. So how else do you stay true to your brand? I think just remembering to think outside of the box and why the company was started in the first place. And I think it's really important for me specifically to celebrate the small things and the big things. As you grow your company, it's really easy to be like, oh, I have to do this thing when three years ago I would have been crying for joy that I got to do this thing. So really just keeping myself grounded and you know, reminding myself that this is really exciting, even through the challenges. So looking from the outside in, um, Art of Sucre almost looks like an overnight success story, the way that it's blown up. But I know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that no. there's so much hard work in the back end and sleepless nights and stress and everything else. If you could hop in that time machine and travel back to 2016, um, and, uh, you know, talk to post honeymoon you coming back with this idea, <laughs> what advice would you give yourself back then um, about, you know, what to look out for or how to handle challenges or anything like that? I think I would tell myself that a lot, a lot of people thought this idea was crazy. I was going to go to graduate school. I had so many friends and just people in my life say, you are insane. What are you doing? What are you giving up to do this? They didn't see the vision. And to not let that get me down obviously didn't stop me, but just to really reassure you are on the right path in doing this. And then as silly as it sounds, it would be little logistical things like mm -hmm. figuring out packaging is a nightmare. And I have wasted so much money on packaging and custom designed shipper boxes that didn't actually hold tape and opened up in the mail and <laughs> all of these small things. It would be really nice to save myself a lot of heartache and money to learn all of those. But at the end of the day, those lessons were hard lessons and were worth it for a reason. Well, it seems like you, uh, regardless of whether you had that advice in 2016 or not, <laughs> you've, you've um, you know, come out of it in, in flying colors. <laughs> um, we are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to hit you with our fast five, the lightning round. I hope you're prepared. It's for cash and prizes, or at least prizes. <laughs> one prize, there will be one prize, no cash. It's a bad prize too, but we'll be back with our fast five, our lightning round on small business, big conversations. Stay tuned. Valerie Mayen and my business is the Yellow Cake Shop Clothing Company. We have been operational since 2009 and our main focus really is to help women achieve more. That's really kind of what we do. Yes, we make clothing for women, but our ultimate goal is to provide 
the most stress-free, fuss-free garments possible that can really give women the confidence, the assurance that they need to be as productive as possible so that they can dominate. Jump starts you know, connection to resources, funding, capital, all kinds of really amazing um, you know, tools for entrepreneurs has been a huge impact in my business growth. I started with Jumpstart in 2017 and I had been in business before that since 2010 and I really didn't see some real actual growth until I started working with Jumpstart. You know, I didn't know what I didn't know and so when I learned how to actually like keep track of my expenses and set actual goals and create budgets and really look at my numbers from the inside, I was able to discover so much more that I was capable of that I didn't realize. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like having a champion in your corner to be your support, to be the person that makes sure that you get, you know, the follow up or the follow through. And so I think for me personally, the tools that they've provided me are not just educational, um, but they're really, I think, a lot more in terms of just learning how to understand my business, uh, having the support that I need as an entrepreneur because it is a very lonely island, and also really being more connected with other entrepreneurs, networking, taking advantage of all the opportunities and resources they provide, whether it's digital marketing, whether it's pitching for you know um, a, a non-interest loan or grant. Um, it really kind of ranges. And I've worked with loads of small business incubators in Cleveland. I mean, you name them, I've worked with them. And Jumpstart was really the first one that I felt was the most impactful and the most results oriented. I'm by no means like at the level that I want to be at, you know, but I really feel like Jumpstart has lit a fire in me that I didn't know existed before. Like I've always considered myself a very like fiery, tenacious person, but I think Jumpstart helped me, helped to give me the tools that I needed to really put that fire to work. You know, like really put gasoline on it and like blow it up in a way that was more impactful. And I feel like that impact will just continue to grow. All right, we are back on Small Business Big Conversations. It is time for our Fast Five with Emily, our lightning round. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, I'm gonna explain to you how this works. There's actually six questions. Okay. Okay, you have to answer five of them. You get one pass. Okay. If you do answer all six, you win a prize. <laughs> and the prize, they're always bad, like I said, mm -hmm. but I think it's good this, this time. Uh, the prize this time is an influencer mention from me on my TikTok account. And I have 11 followers and they're all bots. <laughs> so it's really going to work out for you. Um, all right, let's kick it <laughs> off. What is your favorite candy other than cotton? Oh, favorite candy is Sour Patch Kids. Yes, Team Sour Patch Kids. Mm -hmm. What TikTok trend have you hated or loved the most? And if you want to give me two... That'll work. Oh, TikTok trend that I've hated. I really like the trend right now where you have a friend or a partner and they ask you questions. If you get it wrong, you dip their face in an ice bucket. Oh, why didn't we do that for this? We uh, you you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> we have a bowl right here. <laughs> if you had to get paid in something other than money, what would it be? Oh, clothes. Okay. For sure, clothes. I got a pink and blue shirt. <laughs> Uh, what's an app or productivity tool that you can't live without? Notion, hands down. It is the best thing we've ever done for the business. It's really How great. do you guys use that? Honestly, what don't we use it for? Okay. It's really like our CRM. It's how our production facility knows how to do what and when, and it has all of our recipes. It's everything that it's we a do. It's ringing endorsement. Um, do you have a personal motto? Oh, a personal motto. This is, I hope Emma, who's my right hand at work, is listening to this because she literally got it tattooed on her hand. And it's very simple and it's just as it should. Everything happens exactly as it should. Fantastic. That's five questions already. So you're going to get all six. Perfect. Um, so look out for that. You can duet <laughs> me later if you want. Um, so we just passed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ring my own little bell here. We just passed uh, a thousand subscribers for, for this podcast. Uh, what we, and I, I took a little shot in my basement by myself. What will you do to celebrate 2 million followers when you cross that threshold? Oh man. I would like to say take a trip somewhere like to the beach to unwind. That sounds really great. Will I unwind? Maybe not, but the beach will still be like a good backdrop to do work probably. So. Hey, look, <laughs> you've won. Congratulations wow. to you. Thank you. 
confetti in the air, <laughs> cotton candy in the air. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to eat everything in that bowl uh, before Perfect. you go. This has been an absolute pleasure. I think your story is a really expire, inspiring one. Um, not expiring, because I don't know. You said that's safe. Does it last Nice forever? and fresh. Yep. All right. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Emily, thank you so much thank for you. joining us today. Thank you so much. My guest today has been Emily Harple of Art of Sucra. Stock up on your favorite childhood treat with a twist at artofsucra.com and see their work on TikTok and Instagram at Art of Sucra. Thanks again to Emily for joining us today. Thanks again to the folks at Bar Studios for doing all the work behind the scenes. Thanks to everybody at Jumpstart who makes all of this possible. And of course, thank you to you for watching. Uh, while you're here, be sure to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts to make sure you're the first to be notified of future clips and new episodes. I am Freddie Coffey from Small Business Big Conversations. See you next time.